What happened? What is it? The figure in that room has a rifle. I believe we are looking at a crime scene. This is Dead End Street, one of my favorite episodes of Murdoch Mysteries. We're going to use it to talk about onion clues, those clues that give up their secrets one deliberate drip at a time. We're going to talk about three specific ways mystery writers can hide information within a clue. And we're also going to examine how a sleuth moves through a case, raising a successive series of questions that drives the plot ever onward. The story begins with our sleuth, Detective William Murdoch, examining our onion clue. A model constructed for a competition at a county fair. The model is incredibly detailed and not just on the outside. There are five clue types we talk about on this channel, so what kind is this? It's a witness statement, a clue that records one person's experience of a particular event. Witness statements rarely tell us the whole story. They tell us a distorted or fragmented version of the truth, and they usually come from someone who's unable to provide further clarity. So the first question is, who produced this witness statement? The model was submitted by a Burt Howland of Cherry Lane, according to the fair's organizers. Murdoch goes to investigate, walking down streets that eerily resemble those in the model. When he gets there, Burt tells him that he didn't build the model. Burt's sister Lydia is the builder, and Lydia turns out to be an autistic woman who is non-verbal. Murdoch can't question her about the model, and so the case turns to verifying the veracity of the witness statement. Does it represent something that actually happened, or does it just represent a fear or a fantasy that exists only within Lydia's mind? Murdoch and Constable Crabtree have two lines of inquiry that they can pursue. They can canvass the neighborhood to find out if anyone knows about the shooting, and they can question the owner of the house in which the rifleman was placed. But neither avenue turns up any evidence. No one remembers hearing a gunshot, and although Mrs. Galbraith admits her husband owns a rifle, she says it hasn't been fired in years. With no more leads to go on and no proof that a crime even occurred, Murdoch is on the verge of dropping the case until careful examination of our onion clue yields a detail that just doesn't quite add up. The figure holding the gun, George, he seems disproportionate compared to the other people on the street. Why would that be? Let's pay another visit to Cherry Lane. Murdoch goes back to Mrs. Galbraith's house and through trial and error is able to figure out the position of the rifleman. Uh, so, sir, how did you know there was a mirror in the room? It's the only logical explanation for the small man, George. Lydia saw the shooter reflected in the mirror. We now understand one of the ways in which our onion clue hid information through distortion. We thought the rifleman was aiming in one direction, but now we know he was facing the other because Lydia accurately recorded his appearance as she saw it in the mirror. Once they know the direction the gun was pointed, they're able to deduce the trajectory of the bullet. The putty around this pane is a different color, so this pane has been replaced. The house's owner claims to know nothing about a broken window, but she does tell us the history of the house. She moved in only eight months ago. Before that, the house was a boarding house operated by Mrs. Caruso across the street. So now we know that the witness statement is true, but we still don't know if a crime has occurred. The next line of inquiry is to try to figure out what happened in the boarding house. Murdoch enters the house and finds the bullet, which after ballistic tests is found to be a match to Mr. Galbraith's rifle. Furthermore, Murdoch cooks up a chemical compound that luminesces in the presence of blood and is able to prove that the bullet taken from the wall actually went through a body. So now the state of our investigation is thus. Someone was shot from the Galbraith home using Mr. Galbraith's weapon. The obvious suspect here is Galbraith himself, so it's time to put him on the hot seat. He claims the weapon is his father's old hunting rifle, which he's never fired, and asks Murdoch exactly who it is who he's supposed to have killed. Once again, we're coming up against the fact that while we're pretty sure that Lydia's model is accurate, there are a couple of facts standing against the possibility of a murder. No one on the street admits to hearing a shot, and nobody seems to be missing. And what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to go back to the clue. There's a darker patch of earth right here. If that represents freshly turned soil, it could be a grave. This is another way to hide information, occlusion. 
overcrowding the pertinent information with a wealth of small details that makes it possible for our sleuth to pass it by. The detectives dig in the place where the model shows darker soil, but all they find is... Well, it's a body, all right. Looks like a... What are you doing with my cat? Calm yourself, Mr. Roach. We're just continuing our investigation. He lived to a ripe old age and he deserves his rest. Looking for a body seems to be a dead end, and so Murdoch opens two new lines of inquiry. He asks the coroner, Dr. Ogden, to look for unidentified gunshot victims in the morgue records, and he asks for a list of boarders who left Mrs. Caruso's boarding house without notice. Perhaps one of them didn't leave under his own power. Murdoch also goes back to the model, marveling at the incredible level of detail Lydia has included and looking for any hidden clues he might have missed. Finally, he spots this little ribbon, bunting. This is another example of occlusion, packing one important detail in with a whole lot of fluff. George, when was the last time there was bunting in the streets of Toronto? Well, I suppose that would be Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Did anyone leave the boarding house around June 22nd? Yes, sir. A Grant Abrams. We finally have a name for our victim, and Murdoch goes to inquire about him. All of us gathered at the end of the street to watch the parade, all except the anti-royalist Abrams. He was miserable to the core. He stayed behind in his room. And when did you discover he had gone? He left that night, broke a window, and stole a carpet. A carpet? It now seems very clear exactly what Lydia witnessed. While most of the neighborhood went to watch the parade, Abrams stayed behind. Our villain crept back to the neighborhood and used the vantage point of the Galbraith house to shoot Abrams, then wrapped him up in a carpet and disposed of his body. We also learn a potential motive. Well, Abrams did odd jobs for Mrs. Galbraith in number seven when Mr. Galbraith was at work. I can't say exactly what those jobs were, detective. But when Mr. Galbraith found out there was a real set to between the men right in the middle of the street. And that motive sends us back to ask more questions of Galbraith, who admits that his wife did have an affair with Abrams. Only Galbraith has a perfect alibi. At the time of the shooting, he was playing the trumpet in the parade. We have our victim, we have our timeline, but with Galbraith in the clear, we are without a motive. It's time to have a chat with the neighbors and Murdoch turns up a host of potential suspects. He was a troubled man who took pleasure in finding fault in everyone. And then we all seemed to annoy him. In what way? Oh. Mr. Galbraith played his trombone too loudly. Mr. Roach's cat sat on his windowsill too often. Mr. Caruso parked his fruit cart all wrong. Did you argue with Abrams? He didn't like Lydia walking past his window. But all the neighbors claim to have been together at the end of the street, watching the parade. So everyone, it seems, has an alibi. Perhaps they were all in on it together, or perhaps someone managed to slip away without being noticed. And that's when we realize that the figures at the end of the street have more significance than just a roll call of the neighborhood's occupants. Lydia recorded everything just as she witnessed it, and so these seven figures are the neighbors who watched the parade. Whichever one of them is missing is the eighth figure, the rifleman who shot Mr. Abrams. The path to the solution is now clear. We need to match each of the seven figures to their identity. But there's a problem. Lydia has drawn each of the figures without a face. This is our third method for hiding information within a clue, fragmenting. The sleuth is given a clue, but with one critical piece missing. To solve the case, he'll have to find a way to reconstruct the missing portion of the clue. There's one person who understands the missing information, Lydia. So Murdoch asks her into the station. While Lydia can't just tell us who's who, it turns out that she can let Murdoch know when he's guessed wrong. This scene wraps in both the intellectual satisfaction of solving the case and the emotional satisfaction of seeing Lydia finally make herself understood. George. Felix Roach. We have our villain, but we've still got no chance at a conviction for two reasons. First, we don't have a motive linking Roach to Mr. Abrams, and secondly, we don't have any evidence apart from Lydia's testimony, which will not stand up in court. We're going to have to answer both of these questions in order to get justice. Fortunately, we have a new piece of evidence. Remember when Dr. Ogden went looking for unidentified gunshot victims in the morgue records? Well, she's found one, complete with photographs, and Abrams is positively identified by Mrs. Caruso. 
But these photos throw a new wrinkle into the investigation. Abrams had defensive wounds on both forearms, and that's inconsistent with the fact that he was shot from across the street. Also, the wounds are inflamed as though from an allergic reaction. Could it be a reaction to some kind of metal? Nickel, perhaps? I've seen a similar response of all things to cat scratches. Cat? He lived to a ripe old age. He deserves his rest. Dr. Ogden confirms that the cat was strangled. Finally, we have a motive linking Roach to Abrams, revenge. But we're still missing this link. We've got story proof, Lydia's testimony, which convinces the audience, but we don't have legal proof, evidence that will convince a court. When you've got the story, but not the legal, there are two things you can do. You can try to trick the villain into giving himself away, or you can go looking for a damning clue, something that links the villain conclusively to the crime. Murdoch uses his fluorescing compound to test Mr. Roach's apple cart for blood, and when it's positive, he has his damning clue. What I love about this episode is that it not only makes amazing use of a really fun, deep clue, but it is also an absolute tour de force of setup and payoff. Every important element that was used to tie up the case, the fluorescing chemicals, Roach's dead cat, every element was introduced in the first half of the episode. And when it comes out again in the conclusion, we have the wonderful feeling of a puzzle piece slotting into place. If you're interested in creating your own wonderfully interwoven mystery, I'm going to suggest you check out my video on creating clues. It is my most viewed video for a reason, and it provides you with a really clear, easy way to decide what clues you'll need for your mystery.